So we have one more session before uh, lunch, so which is an uh, open CL. Uh, I'm going to give uh, an open CL uh, overview, and open CL is for parallel uh, computation. How many people here have used open CL? Has anyone used open CL? Yeah, a few people, a few people. Okay, a few. All right, good. So the the idea behind open CL um, is the fact that parallel programming is becoming more and more normal. Uh, but in the past, we had parallel CPUs, uh, CPUs that are becoming multi-core, 2, 4, 8, 16 or more, and GPUs that have always been programmable, uh, sorry, always been very powerful, but are now becoming more and more programmable. Uh, but in the past, we had to use different programming frameworks for programming the different types of hardware. Uh, with CPUs, you would use something like pthreads or OpenMP. On GPUs, in the past, you'd use shading languages, uh, GP, GPU. We need a single programming framework that lets us run code once and have it run on whatever um, hardware is in the system, be it a mixture of CPUs, GPUs, uh, or other uh, parallel uh, processors. That was really the inspiration behind uh, OpenCL. So the big idea is really not that new. It's been around for a while. The, the new thing is to be able to get this out there in a widely supported open uh, standard is that you don't run a traditional loop. You don't run a for, a for loop that runs uh, a million times sequentially for every pixel in a million uh, pixel image you define a kernel, which is the work you want to do on every word item or every pixel in an image, for example. And then you issue those kernels out in parallel across as much hardware as you can to get as much uh, parallel performance as you can. So you define a work domain, which contains all of the work items that you want to be processed. And you write a kernel in a derivative of ISO C99, so it's a C, C kernel. And you uh, take those kernels in time and execute them in parallel. And like the, the question earlier, we're supporting quite a wide range of target hardware. GPUs, uh, CPUs, DSPs, uh, embedded systems, uh, and even now FPGAs are beginning to use OpenCL to program their FPGA. Uh, hardware and run in parallel across it. So, what are the pieces in OpenCL? Every OpenCL implementation has a number of APIs and a kernel language. This is the OpenCLC kernel language. You have one API called the Platform Layer API, which is to query the compute resources that you have in the system, uh, select them, and initialize them. Get things set up how you want for your uh, application. You have the kernel language, OpenCLC, where you write the kernels, and then you have a runtime API, where you take your kernel source code, you compile them at execution time, distribute them across the compute resources, and gather back uh, the results. Now, OpenCL uh, already has an embedded profile built in. So we will never need an OpenCL ES. Uh, OpenGL didn't think about embedded systems when it was invented 20 years ago. So we needed to have a separate API. We learned from that lesson. So OpenCL from version 1.0 has an embedded profile built in. And if you elect to use the embedded profile, uh, then uh, it's a profile that's designed to run easier on mobile devices. Um, so if you're looking for OpenCL ES, um, if you won't find it, it's already built in to OpenCL uh, the main specification. The embedded profile, it doesn't remove much functionality. The functionality is pretty much the same between the main profile and the embedded profile. The main thing that the embedded profile does is reduce the requirements on precision. Full OpenCL is often used in supercomputers where 
numerical position very often to 64 bit floating point is very critical. And so, OpenCL full profile has very precise definitions on the amount of numerical precision you must deliver. And conformance tests test that precision very exactly. Now, mobile phones probably don't need applications yet that need that amount of 64 bit floating point precision. They're not yet using our mobile phones as supercomputers um, yet. Um, so we can reduce the precision requirements for things like image processing, video processing, physics simulation for a game. We can do with much less precision. And so the embedded profile makes it easier to ship OpenCL on uh, embedded hardware over the next few years. So we have many uh, working group members, uh, many leading companies from the industry. Um, so we have processor vendors, system OEMs, uh, middleware vendors like CodePlay, uh, we're developing tools on top of OpenCL, uh, application developers like uh, EA, who are using OpenCL for the next generation of physics engines, for example. Um, NVIDIA's chair opens an Apple is a specification and editor. So OpenCL, when we first developed OpenCL 1.0, uh, it uh, was the world record for how fast we could generate a specification. When there's a strong in commercial incentive, uh, standards can move very fast from Apple coming through the door with a proposal to make OpenCL to having a public uh, specification on the website uh, that's only six months. To achieve that, the work group was meeting like two or three times a week. A lot of work went into that. Since we had 1.0, the OpenCL work group has aimed for an 18-month specification update. It's fast enough that we can respond to developer requests, but not too fast to confuse everybody. So we are 18 months between 1.0 and 1.1, and another 18 months between 1.1 and 1.2. 1.2 was released in uh, November 2011, just, just a few months ago. So 1.2, there were some significant updates. I will give you some uh, insight into the key uh, updates. It was mainly requests from developers coming in to the working group that caused the working group to add new functionality uh, that were important uh, to uh, developers. And uh, it was important, though, to keep it backwards compatible. So 1.2 is backwards compatible with 1.1, and 1.1 is backwards compatible with 1.0. So any OpenCL application, 1.0, 1.1, and 1.2, will run on the latest OpenCL 1.2 uh, implementations. And of course, OpenCL 1.2 has maintained the embedded profile. So let's look at some of the, the details. Um, what is this programming language, the programming language that we use to program the kernels? Well, it's called OpenCLC. It's as close to C99 that we can make it. We try to make the minimum number of changes. So we had to take out some C99 features that were um, incompatible with parallel programming. Uh, so function pointers, uh, recursion, variable length arrays, uh, and bit fields have been removed. Um, but uh, we then added, again, the, the minimum changes but we needed to add some features to enable us to express parallelism in OpenCLC programs. So we have the concept of work items and work groups. A uh, work item is the individual data element that needs to be processed. A work group is a collection of those. I'll show you how that works in a second. We've added some vector types, uh, which is obviously a big uh, plus when you're trying to express vector operations uh, for parallel execution. Uh, there are some synchronization primitives and some address space qualifiers. Uh, again, I'll show how these work together. But these two, they kind of tell you that OpenCL is deliberately a very low level 
API, you get a lot of control over exactly how your hardware and memory is being managed. In fact, as the programmer, you control pretty much everything. That's either good or bad, depending on the type of programmer that you are. If you are a programmer that wants the maximum performance, uh, or you're writing tools in the middle there that needs to get absolute control over the hardware, OpenCL will give that to you. If you're more of a beginner programmer and you're not uh, an, more of an expert in parallel architecture, you might find OpenCL is too powerful. And there are an increasing number of tools that are built over OpenCL, like the code play tools um, that will simplify your program. Very often you can just write a C program and take it through the tool, and the tool will figure out how to give you parallel execution. Um, but the OpenCL API is the foundation on which those tools are built. And so uh, I think it, it is a good thing that OpenCL is this powerful, but again, you should look to see whether this is the right level for you, or you should pick a tool that's built on top uh, of the OpenCL uh, API. The other thing that we've uh, included is a large set of built-in functions for image uh, manipulation and math, for example. So again, it gives the opportunity to the hardware vendors uh, to optimize their OpenCL implementations uh, to give good performance. So this is how OpenCL looks at a system. Um, it's kind of um, kind of PC-centric uh, view of the world, I guess. Um, there's a host processor where the controlling program and the main application runs. And then you have the parallel compute resources uh, that runs the kernels in parallel. And OpenCL defines those as compute devices. You might think of those uh, in a PC example, uh, as being a GPU card in a PCI Express slot. And there are compute units within each compute device. You might think of those as a, as a GPU on a, on a GPU card. There might be multiple GPUs. And then there are processing elements within the compute units. You might think of those as the individual processors in the CD pipelines uh, inside a GPU. Now that's just an example, and really you can find almost any compute device out there today, even a mobile phone, you can uh, look at it and program it uh, as if it has this kind of topology. So the execution model, the ap application runs on the host, and that the host is responsible for sending the work out to the compute uh, devices. And how does that work in practice? So the programmer defines a context, and the context can have multiple compute devices, and the context is the environment in which the parallel execution runs. So it includes the devices, and includes their memory, and it includes the command queues. The command queues are the queues that the host uses to pass the work to be executed down from the host down into the compute uh, devices. So each uh, context has a collection of programs. That's the kernels that you want to execute. Uh, the kernels are basically a C function. And then you have this collection of um, data elements, the work items that you want to be processed. Again, an easy example to imagine is an image. Uh, it's a 2D array of work items. Each work item is a, is a pixel. But of course, that's just one example. You can have any type of data uh, did you wish. And then pass the commands from the host down into the context through the queues. You can have queues executed in order or out of order. Uh, out of order can be faster, but very often you need the calculations to happen in the order in which you send them down. Uh, so you can choose which is best for your application. You can send them out of order if every work item is independent. 
uh, or you can send them in order if you need to calculate one result that's used in a subsequent stage. Uh, it might be slightly slower, but of course it gives you the right answer, which is important. This is how you actually create an OpenCL program. You have real compute resources. There might be CPUs, and GPUs, and DSPs, and you define a context that has uses some combination of these. You have your programs, you compile them. When you want to execute the program, it creates the kernels that are going to be downloaded to the compute devices. And of course, the, the compiler will know at that point whether it's going to be running on a CPU or a GPU. So the compiler will generate the right target code for the devices. You have a collection of uh, memory objects, images, and buffers. And then you have your command queues that you use for sending these kernels down into the context for processing work items uh, in these memory objects. So here, here's our example of uh, an image again. So this is just an example. Of course, you can use OpenCL for a lot more different things than just image processing. But an image is easy to visualize, so it's a good example. This is, a, this is an image that has a million pixels, a uh, thousand by a thousand. So this is our domain of work items. We want to do processing on each of those pixels. We can get efficiency and we can map the computation efficiently onto hardware with the concept of work groups where we have a, an amount of computation that happens within a local area. So in this case, we've de decided, and again, OpenCL gives you the power to control this. You have, therefore, you have to choose. Um, in this case, we've decided to split our image up into local work groups of 128 by 128. And then we split up the entire image into uh, work groups. Now, the work groups are uh, kind of a local computation domain, and you have more flexibility in the calculations that execute within uh, a work group. For example, you can synchronize the uh, calculations between work items within a work group. So you can uh, program to say, I need this pixel to be computed before I start computing any other pixels or this pixel. You can use barriers and fences as synchronization points uh, between the work items in the work group. So it's, it's, the, it's the most local uh, area of computation. You can't synchronize outside of a work group uh, within OpenCLC. So it's important that you find the right work group uh, architecture to suit your uh, algorithms and your application. So how does this synchronization work? Um, so here's an example where we have um, two uh, devices in a context. We have a CPU and a GPU. Uh, you can run uh, kernels synchronized or unsynchronized. So here's an example where we have one kernel that's sent down to the CPU device. Oh, there, uh, sorry, down to the GPU device down here. And it will uh, get, the first kernel will get loaded and execute immediately. The programmer can decide to run things uh, unsynchronized. So the second kernel will get loaded right away as soon as it's ready on kernel two. So this kernel two execution will start even though the results of kernel one are not yet ready. That's the fastest way. But if you need the results in kernel one as an input to kernel two, obviously this is not going to work. So if that's the case, you can set up uh, synchronization. So first kernel gets loaded into the GPU. You can force the second kernel to wait until the result of kernel one uh, is ready. And then, and only then, will the second kernel uh, get loaded. So the results from this output can be uh, used as an input uh, over here. So the OpenCL memory model, uh, again, is very explicit. 
uh, the programmer has total control over how data is moved through the various memory uh, in the system. We have uh, the fastest memory is the private memory. This is typically the memory inside a DSP or a GPU used for actually calculating each work item. The, the memory that the programmer controls includes the local memory. That's the memory that's shared within a work group. You have the global memory. That's the memory that's visible to and shared between all the work groups. And then you have the host memory, which can be across a lower bandwidth link, such as a PCI Express Plus if you're in PC. So the programmer must load the right data into the right place and then explicitly gather back uh, the results. Um, again, a lot of power, um, but uh, a lot of uh, responsibility for the programmer to get things uh, correct. So what are some of the new things in OpenCL 1.2? Again, these are the things that the developer community asked uh, the OpenCL working group to include in this latest generation of the specification. There's actually quite a lot of new functionality. I, we've picked out here uh, two or three of the most important new functions uh, that are, I think, most important to developers. The first one is uh, device partitioning. So you have multiple compute devices in a system being controlled by the host. Um, each compute device can have multiple compute uh, units. Device partitioning gives you more flexibility on how these compute units within a device are actually used. You can divide up the available compute units to form virtual compute devices. So for example, you might want to have a real-time task happening inside your application that you want to dedicate some compute units to so you can guarantee a real-time response, a real-time quality of service. You don't want those compute units to be sometimes off doing something else then have to swap back in. So you could, for example, choose to create a sub-device number one with two of those compute units, and you're going to reserve those for your real-time processing. And then you'll use the rest of the compute units for your, your mainline processing tasks. There are actually three ways that you can decide how you split up these compute units. You can split a compute device into equal-sized groups if you just want to have a, a load spread evenly across available resources. You can provide your explicit list of uh, uh, group sizes, or you can actually create devices that are sharing part of a cache hierarchy. And if so, if your algorithm is particularly memory bandwidth intensive, by creating groups of compute units that, are, that you know are grouped around a particular cache line, uh, or cache um, a buffer in a hierarchy, you can have very efficient memory access from that group of compute units. Uh, and so for certain types of algorithm, it can make a big difference in terms of uh, overall performance. Again, giving a lot of power to the program. The other uh, really significant thing that was added in 1.2 was custom devices. And this, this came from the DSP embedded community and the FPGA community. Embedded platforms often contain specialized hardware that is not programmable in OpenCLC. A good example is a video decoder. Um, it's not typically programmable at the C level. And yet, the video decode could be a vital part of an overall OpenCL application. So how can you bring that video decode functionality into the OpenCL control flow without needing to go out of OpenCL and then back into OpenCL, which would cost time and power? So we can do this now with custom devices. We can declare a built-in kernel that can represent the data flow of that 
dedicated piece of hardware. So now we can control that dedicated piece of hardware from the standard OpenCL framework. All of the events and synchronization, uh, all the memory hierarchy, control, the APIs that we were talking about before, they can all be used. It's quite a sophisticated control system. And now we can integrate uh, DSP hardware uh, but even though we don't actually compile and run an open CLC kernel, it's much easier to integrate uh, a dedicated piece of hardware into open CLC than it is to write a compiler for a dedicated piece of hardware. So FPGAs are one example of devices that are already exposing this kind of built-in kernels. Some FPGAs you can actually program too. But very often, FPGAs are used to implement dedicated hardware that we would use built-in kernels uh, to support. Another critical uh, thing that we were asked for um, is an, an installable client driver for OpenCL. OpenGL has had installable client drivers for many years, and it enables you to install multiple OpenCL implementations from multiple vendors on the same system. So on a PC, um, you can have uh, an AMD, an um, Intel, and a NVIDIA uh, OpenCL implementation all running on the same uh, PC. Before we had the installable client driver, if you tried to do that, you had uh, an AMD OpenCL, and then you installed an Intel OpenCL, they would write all over each other, and neither installation would work they would all get confused. So an installable client driver defines how each vendor installs their drivers without overriding uh, the other vendors. So there's some degree of cooperation over install methods. And then we have a real-time ICD loader, which acts as a switch between all of the run times that are running on a system and the application. The ICD loader acts as a demultiplexer. So the application can say, okay, right now I'm going to use the AMD OpenCL, and then can switch that. I'm going to use the NVIDIA OpenCL, and then use the uh, Intel OpenCL. They can all be running in parallel. But the application gets to decide which of those implementations gets which commands and which computation. Some other uh, OpenCL 1.2. We can now separately compile and link OpenCLC. That seems like so obvious because G uh, CPUs have had that for many, many, many years. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility in creating OpenCLC libraries that can be reused. Because that's also kind of a big hole in OpenCL 1.1. Um, that, now that's fixed. Uh, we have enhanced image support. So now we can have 1D images and arrays of 1D and 2D images. Uh, we have better sharing between OpenCL and OpenGL. Uh, so we can create uh, an OpenCL image from an OpenGL texture. We have better surface sharing with DX9 and DX11. And uh, there are actually many more. There's a red line spec as well as the, the main line spec on the Kronos website. So if you want to know every last change, it's easy. It's easy for you to go um, into the spec and look at every last little change uh, that the uh, working group has made. So the, where are we in terms of deployments? The OpenCL uh, is now deployed uh, widely on the desktop. We have Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, uh, all shipping uh, OpenCL. Uh, the best place to get up-to-date information on those desktop implementations is to go to those websites. Uh, some links uh, here. And as Juan said, all these slides are going to be made available uh, on the Kronos website. Yes? Who has the best performance? That's a great question. Uh, it will depend on the hardware very often. Question well, two, who has the best performance open CR? Uh, NVIDIA. <laughs> 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 okay. I have also part of the in my and then when they do, 
conversion involves uh, performance. But that, that is not open. It's not open. It's only the result on the average. Right. So, Kronos itself doesn't do benchmark. It's incompatible to try and define the open standards and to set the competitors up against each other in the same organization. It, it just goes crazy. But you, you, you have a good question. Of course, developers need to know what the relevant performance are. There are third party benchmarks out there. Kishanti is, for example, a third party benchmarking company. They do the GL benchmark uh, APIs, the widely used 3D graphic benchmarking. They now have an OpenCL benchmark that's becoming quite widely used. Um, so um, there are a number of third parties that I know of that are also developing you know, independent benchmarks. So that they would be the tools that you could use to measure real system performance. Well, another question is about Apple. Apple is the inventor of OpenCL. They were the initiator. Oh, the initiator. Yeah. What does Apple have or want? Yes, of course. That's why Apple bought the idea to Kronos to create an open standard so OpenCL would be available across many different platforms. And the I think right now OpenCL is available on desktop, PC and Apple and, and Linux. Uh, this year is going to be the year that OpenCL begins to appear on mobile devices. Yeah, so uh, um, I know of a number of different vendors that are actively developing OpenCL. Some of them have announced already that they're going to be shipping on mobile, uh, Android, and other operating systems. Um, there are going to be, I think, multiple OpenCLs on mobile before the end of this year. But it's an important point. It's, it's interesting. Apple did a good job in proposing OpenCL, but it's not an Apple standard. It's all those companies that we saw earlier in the working group, they all have an equal voice and an equal vote in how OpenCL develops. It's not just Apple. Uh, we have some, some books. Again, the links are here. Uh, we're doing spec translations, including we're working on uh, Chinese translations of OpenCL 1.2. They should be available pretty quickly. We'll announce those on the website. And uh, just like Tom, the reference card, we have reference card for OpenCL as well. There are online man pages, uh, developer forums. We do really listen to the forums. A lot of the 1.2 features came directly from feedback on those forums. So if, you, if it's something you don't like or find a problem with, OpenCL and you're not a member, uh, please do give us your feedback there. Uh, it really does make a difference. Uh, the forward-looking roadmap for OpenCL. There are two two main development paths. We're currently figuring out what the next generation of OpenCL is going to be. Um, it's clear that we want to put more power and flexibility in the memory and the execution models. Um, we actually have meetings over the next few months where we'll, we'll be finalizing what that actually means. There's a lot of debate, a lot of discussion in the working groups right now uh, about that. Um, we want to um, have more flexibility in exposing the newest generations of GPU hardware as they appear over the next year or two. We're also working closely with the WebCL working group uh, to bring OpenCL capability into the browser. Looking down into the software stack, we actually now have a working group Actually, it's a sub-working group inside OpenCL that's de defining OpenCL Sphere, which is a standard intermediate representation, probably based on LLVM. So we could share a common front-end compiler and have a cross-vendor intermediate representation. So vendors would only need to supply an IR to target binary compiler uh, this would give a lot more flexibility for stronger front-end tools and would mean developers didn't need to ship the source of their kernels, which for many of developers, particularly the game developers, that's an important consideration. So I think this is actually a very important uh, project. We actually have one other working group, which is called OpenCL HLM, High Level Model. 
which is looking at making things easier for the programmer. Because we mentioned that OpenCL is very powerful, um, but it can be quite complex. Um, a lot of programmers just want to write C++ and let the system figure out how to make things go faster. Um, there are a number of initiatives in the industry. Microsoft has the um, C++ AMP initiative, uh, the OpenMP group, and uh, NVIDIA actually are doing the direct uh, uh, ACC. Um, and then we have OpenCL, HMM. They're all essentially trying to do the same thing. Take as close as possible to C11, C++11, and figure out in automatically you know, how to get good parallelization in the system. You know, HLM and OpenCL will provide a C++ based language that will automatically generate uh, OpenCL code. So uh, again, that is a very uh, important uh, initiative. So that's the, that's the end of the presentation. Are there any questions before we break for lunch? Yes. In the slide, I introduced the structure of the program written in OpenCLC. You say it's better for a program who has insight into the structure of hardware and can, can get better performance. Yes. And you introduce ICP. Yes. Uh, I, I wonder if there are any contradiction here. There is some. There is some contradiction. It's it's one of the again. It's a conscious decision. The open CL went very low level, so it would be the foundation for lots of higher levels of software and compilers. It does mean that if you want to get the best performance, the very best performance, you might have to make code changes for one architecture versus another architecture. So OpenCL, it's not magic. If you have a quad-core CPU, and you have a very highly parallel GPU. You, you can write OpenCL code that will run on both without any changes. But if you want the best performance out of the quad core CPU versus a GPU, you will probably need to restructure how you use the memories and how you use the processing. So we have functional portability. You can write a piece of code and it will run it will run everywhere. But don't yet have performance portability where it will run optimally everywhere. And that's one reason why this is so important. I think this is the way where you abstract it at a higher level. You just write OpenCL, uh, oh, write C++, and the system will say, okay, I'm running now on four CPUs. I'll construct things this way automatically. That is the way that we will finally get to where we want to be, a performance portability. In the meantime, though, it's, it's a decision that the developer has to make. You can go faster if you put more effort into optimizing the different architectures. The question is, how important is that to you? And how much effort do you want to put in? And how much faster is it going to go? We don't solve that problem automatically yet. This this will have a chance to do that, but that's like coming this year, next year. Yeah. I have a crazy question. I would like to find a. Uh, it's similar to related to this question. This open CL Yeah. I want to find a easy way, easy way learning curve for my engineers now. Right. They don't want to learn from this right. kernel level. And uh, so far, I, I know some package outside, like one is called the uh, yeah. ACL, one is yes. called the CLP. <laughs> yes. Both maintained by small group of yes. and a uh, small company. Yes. I'm a little bit suspicious to them uh, which way to take and which one is. But I uh, just want to get tips from you if you heard anything which is uh, more trustworthy for this. Level of a rubber function that uh, the, the, yeah. my engineer started. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I haven't used either of those, so I, I'm not really the right person. I don't want to say something bad about someone. Yeah. Um, but, but I can say perhaps a couple of things. I, I think 
using higher level tools is the right way to go if you don't want to go right down to the current level. So I think the investigation that you're doing of which tools are good is the right investigation. Um, the, I, I have worked closely with the code plane people. In fact, they were here with us in Beijing. And I've talked to them a lot in the OpenCL work group. I've been impressed by them, their, by their expertise and their technology. Um, so in your exploration, I would definitely encourage you to look at those guys. I think that they've been around for many years. They're a very reputable company, putting a lot of investment into open, higher level OpenCL tools. And in fact, they're the chair of OpenCL HLM. So you know, they're kind of philosophy that they have and the kind of tools that they're building are kind of influencing OpenCL HLM. So it's likely to be like a long term, a safer long term investment, I would say. And do they have some uh, public uh, Yes, they do, absolutely. Because the code play. Is it the name code play? Code. So I should be able to find it. Yes. Code play, OpenCL. Yes, yes, yes. See if I can. Um, well, can come to me afterwards. I'll, I'll, yeah. It's not Coldplay, that's that's the pop group. This is, <laughs> this is Coldplay. They're the tools company. <laughs> Another question. Yes. What's the relation with OpenCL? I'm sorry. Coldplay and OpenCL, what's the relation in the future? Yes, that's, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> so that's a good question. I mean, I'm from NVIDIA. Obviously, NVIDIA has CUDA, uh, which is in the same space as OpenCL. Yeah. So a lot of people ask us, you know, what is the competitive dynamic uh, between uh, OpenCL and CUDA? It's a great question. I mean, NVIDIA is really supporting CUDA and, re and really supporting OpenCL. And you know, every standard has its proprietary competitor. Uh, OpenGL has DirectX. WebGL has Stage 3. HTML5 has Splash. It's, it's a very natural thing. There's a leader, and then the rest of the industry creates a standard to counterbalance it. And the things work out best when there's a healthy competition between the two. It makes everyone improve. Now, it happens that in this case, CUDA is the proprietary leader, and OpenCL is the standard. The NVIDIA is pushing CUDA very successfully in uh, HPC, high performance computing, supercomputing. And but AMD and Intel are doing the same thing with OpenCL. That's a very healthy competition. And uh, there are advantages. The proprietary leader can sometimes move faster, uh, but the open standard is supported on more platforms. So it really depends on which is most important. So, what's the role of so NVIDIA playing with OpenCL? I am. It's the leader in certain markets. Okay. So, so HH, well, Arguably, NVIDIA would say it's the leader in HPC and uh, uh, high end computing. But there's a, a, an addition, and that's a good, healthy competition. AMD and Intel and NVIDIA and, well, and other people will have that good competition out there. In, but I assume that OpenCL do not have many applications like CUDA. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that is the competition that's underway. In the mobile space, the I think CUDA is unlikely to be widely adopted in the mobile space. Um, a proprietary API in the mobile industry is really doesn't really meet market needs. I think uh, OpenCL in in the mobile is going to be fundamental to bring parallel computation to mobile devices and into the web through WebCL. So. I think the mobile and the web, OpenCL is going to be very widely used, and then NVIDIA and the other guys can find it out in the high end. So, so, so the problem is that the OpenCL is more expensive than the mobile. Now, the HPC is also expensive. Intel and AMD are already shipping, and, and NVIDIA too. But in the end, NVIDIA doesn't really mind whether you use CUDA or OpenCL, as long as you get to use great GPUs. It doesn't really matter to us which API you use. And CUDA has strengths, OpenCL has strengths. So OpenCL is, uh, NVIDIA is going to support both in HPC. But in mobile, 
Three, and it's going to be all over the sea. Well, that's the next generation of the emitters have a graphic to build on. Or do they are all to the outdoors? Um, in the mobile space, I would expect open CL to be the primary engine. Primary, yeah. Yeah, primary engine. Yeah. How about you, Tom? Was that good? <laughs> <laughs> 那就是今天上午的会议呢，基本就是到现在就结束了。然后呢，下午的话，我们是 n e o 先给大家带领的，就是关于 Web G L 和 C L 的内容。然后后边呢，还有就是关于 Open V G 的，是有就是晃，还有那个 Tommy， 他们两个人会有从不同的角度给大家讲一下。呃，在之后呢，就是 Eric 给大家讲关于 Open S 呃 S L E S 还有 Max A L， 然后他也会就是更多去从游戏制作，然后这个方面游戏的方面也有就有些关注的东西给大家再讲一下。呃，最后的话呢，是由 c a s t i n g 给我们带来一个讨论的环节，是一个互动的环节。我也希望到时候大家呢也可以积极的参与到里边。我们在最后也有一个抽奖互动的这么一个游算是游戏吧。最后我们在讨论会的时候，嗯、呃，稍后呢大家吃午饭的时候需要到我这边拿一下这个餐券。餐厅是在一层有一个自助餐厅，我们有一个 c o l o s 的一个专区，到那边给他们这个餐券就可以。嗯，现在的时间是。呃，一点一刻钟，然后我们下午应该是两点到两点十分左右吧，请大家回来，然后我们再继续下面的会议，好吗？